What's going on YouTube? Bowtie Teacher here, and today we're talking about 19th century reform, aka some big changes. These movements each target an area of American society that, well, needed a little bit of work. What's awesome about this video is that our focus is going to be on some amazing women and people of color who played a crucial role in reform. Our agenda kind of looks like this. We'll start with looking at the background of 19th century America, then move to the Second Great Awakening, which is seen by many historians as the spark to this era of reform. Then we'll move into some of the reforms, which are women's rights, temperance, prisons, education, and abolition. If there's a specific reform you're here to learn about, I've separated the video by each reform movement, so feel free to skip ahead. Well, regardless of why you're here, I'm happy that you are. And if you could hit that like and subscribe button, I would seriously appreciate it as it helps the channel. Now that we got that out of the way, though, let's take a look at how the United States takes a few crucial steps to becoming a better place. Before we can jump into the specific reform movements, we need to paint a picture of where the United States is at the time of these shifts. Unfortunately, this is not an easy task, as the 19th century is easily one of the most transformative times in our very short history. So we'll try to do this as a tale of two maps. The first of these on the left looks at westward expansion during this time. The United States pushes west and has several land acquisitions, such as the Louisiana Purchase, Texas Annexation, Oregon Territory, Mexican Session, and the Gadsden Purchase. As I'm sure you've guessed, these land acquisitions were gained through different means, whether that be mutual treaties, purchase agreements, or the use of military and force. All of these were spurred by the 19th century belief in Manifest Destiny that led Americans to believe that all Western territory was their God-given right. If you're interested in learning more about this, I've linked my video on Manifest Destiny and expansion in the video description. In addition to westward expansion, the United States was also grappling with the growing disagreement between northern and southern states over the topic of slavery. This divide is shown in the map on the right. Many southern farmers had grown largely dependent on the industry of slavery, as had northern manufacturing. This second part is often what trips many history students up, which is that even though the North is frequently painted as always being against slavery, there were many northern textile businesses that depended on the cheap prices that southern farmers were able to sell their crops at without having to pay for labor. This growing issue, which will be further addressed in another video, is that many northerners did not want to see the institution expand westward, which Southerners took as a direct attack on their livelihood. This would eventually boil over and become the catalyst to the American Civil War. Though what I just described as the coming of the Civil War probably sounded like the point in a movie where a Thanos-type villain would be unveiled, this video is actually going to highlight the good changes, or the reforms, of the 19th century. Many of these reforms originate with the Second Great Awakening. You're probably sitting there thinking, wait, Second Great Awakening? When did the first happen? The first came about a century, or a hundred years, earlier, around the same time as the Enlightenment, which, if you remember, helped push the colonies to declare their independence. When we use the term Great Awakening, we're talking about a revival of religion and a method of making people excited about religion again. So even though we aren't literally talking about the second time that people are waking up, this movement sought to make people have greater buy-in to Christianity. So I guess this would help them be a bit less like Homer during church. Now that we're awake, the Second Great Awakening emphasized the idea of personal salvation and promoted a sense of social responsibility which urged believers to work towards making society a better place while they were alive, you know, through reform type things. In short, this movement tried to dismiss the idea of predestination, which is the belief that your final destination of heaven or hell is decided when you're born. Instead, supporters of this push that if you're a good person, you'll likely go up, and those who are bad, well, down. But this is all determined by your own actions while you're alive. The primary leaders of this movement were these incredibly happy-looking gents, Charles Grandison Finney and Lyman Beecher, who appear to be having an intense staring competition on my slide. Anyway, they were influential Christians who traveled extensively, holding camp meetings and revival gatherings that attracted large crowds. These camp meetings were not like your traditional church service, but got people up and out of their seats and made Christianity exciting again. They were kind of like a concert for Christianity. 
If they were running for president, they'd probably release hats that would likely say something like, make church exciting again, or something like that. The revival excitement of the Second Great Awakening sparked a wave of social reform movements across America. These included movements advocating for abolitionism, women's rights, temperance, prison reform, and education reform. Many reformers, who are people who are supporting these movements, were motivated by their religious convictions, viewing social activism as a way to influence their Christian duty and go to heaven. Out of the Second Great Awakening comes a fiery desire among women and more progressive men to push for women's rights and equality. Rooted in the desire for social and political change, this movement gained momentum in the mid-1800s and paved the way for significant advancement in women's rights. While overall equality was the main goal of the movement, the primary focus of this specific part of the movement was to secure women's suffrage. Now don't be fooled by the phrasing here. Suffrage is the right to vote, not a fancy way of talking about suffering, which women were already experiencing under the male-dominated society, often known as the patriarchy. Some of the key figures in this movement were Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott, each shown on the right side of the slide here. Each of these strong women were pivotal in shaping the foundation of the women's rights movement. One of the main historical events that takes place during this reform is the Seneca Falls Conference of 1848. This was the first women's rights convention in the United States and led to the drafting of the Declaration of Sentiments, which demanded equal rights for women, including the right to vote. The document took the Declaration of Independence and reworded it to be, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women were created equal. This conference and adoption of the Declaration was supported by many women and progressive men who were in attendance. Though the fight for women's rights would be delayed due to the Civil War and focus on the aftermath, the work of women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott paved the way for the adoption of the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote in late 1920. Now, while women were fighting for the right to vote, we will see a consistent theme in the next couple reform movements, which is that they were largely supported by women. Due to having a lower status in society when compared to white men, women were able to empathize with the strife and the feelings of other groups. All right, to empathize means that they can imagine themselves in the position of others. Let's take a look at some of these people and the movements that they supported. During the 19th century, alcohol consumption rose in the United States, particularly in urban areas or cities and amongst men. This led to major issues among families as working men would receive their pay and instead of utilizing it to help their family, often went to the bar. The following political cartoon became very popular and depicts the situation well. Here you can see the effects of alcoholism that was becoming especially common, such as men having early deaths, which is shown in many spots in the cartoon. Dads being separated from their kids and or not contributing to home life. And an irrational outbreak of violence amongst men. While there are many other aspects shown in this cartoon, a group, primarily women, who were experiencing the brunt of this alcoholism emerged to fight it. This reform, known as the temperance movement, was created to fight the causes of alcohol abuse. Some of the main supporters of this were Carrie Nation and Frances Willard. Similar to the fight for women's suffrage, the temperance movement was derailed by the Civil War, yet another theme that we will unfortunately see in our reform movements. Despite this, it becomes the basis for the 18th Amendment and the creation of Prohibition, which made the sale of and consumption of alcohol illegal for a decade and a half until it was overturned by the ironically numbered 21st Amendment. During the 19th century, the prison system in the United States was in dire need of reform. Prisons were overcrowded, unsanitary, and lacked proper facilities for rehabilitation. In this challenging environment, Dorothea Dix emerged as a prominent figure in the prison reform movement. Dorothea Dix was a social reformer and an advocate for the mentally ill, but her efforts extended to improving conditions in prisons as well. She dedicated herself to visiting prisons across the country, documenting the appalling conditions she witnessed, and advocating for change. Dix believed that prisoners, especially those who were mentally ill, deserved humane treatment and the opportunity for rehabilitation. Her tireless efforts led to the establishment of mental asylums and the adoption of reform measures in prisons. Her work brought public attention to the need for proper mental health care within the prison systems and helped shift public opinions toward more compassionate treatment of prisoners. This overall brought changes to prisons being viewed as places of punishment and more as places of rehabilitation. As you should be seeing, these reform movements were largely about the groups that society had turned their back on. But what about kids? 
what were they doing during their time and were they getting any of this reform business? Let's dive into 19th century school and find out. When we talk about schools in the 19th century, the main issue we'll be focusing on is not the treatment of students as we saw with prison reform, but instead the overall availability of public schools for kids. Before we get into the reform, we need to understand why it is that the northern region of the country had way more schools in the south. As people populated the eastern half of the United States in the 18th century or the 1700s, the way towns were set up was largely due to how people could do business. Due to a lack of cars, trains, or planes, the method of transportation and thus business was largely by water. Northern states, which primarily have narrow, shallow, and rough rivers, were therefore dependent on being near the Atlantic coast. If you've ever been whitewater rafting in the Northeast, you know exactly why larger ships that carry goods would not want to traverse these rivers. The coastal locations people settled in, like New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Delaware, allowed for traditional towns to be set up. These towns frequently had many amenities, such as schools within walking distance for kids, and thus made sense why schools could thrive there. That being said, the only kids who were able to actually attend school were those whose parents could afford uh, for them to not be working at home and therefore contributing to their family business. So the next time you're thinking about complaining about school, remember, you could be at home churning butter for hours, which I promise you is infinitely worse than reading and writing. By contrast, in many southern states, the wider, deeper, and slower moving rivers were perfect for ships to travel up and down. Additionally, the climate of the southern states, which was frequently very warm and good for farming, allowed for people to want to do exactly that. Therefore, many people decided to live alongside rivers where they could easily trade instead of in towns, which leads to people often being very spread out. If you've ever driven through a rural area, and if you realize that you can probably count the number of houses you've seen after, right, after driving several miles on one hand, that's the kind of spread out we're talking about here. <laughs> Therefore, many Southern families decide to homeschool their children with information that they deem necessary for them to know and then utilize them for working at home on the farm to help the family. Given this divide between not only the regions of the United States, but also within the social classes that made quality education often for just the wealthy, there was a need for change. Some might say this was an opportunity for them to learn from their mistakes. Get it? That's a school joke. Anyway, the need for reform became especially apparent as the nation continued to expand west and the north became industrialized. The goal of the movement was to establish free, required, and standardized public schools for all kids. This goal directly attacked the current state of schooling, which only really saw the education of the northern rich, which kept them at the top, while the children of the working class families were unable to gain the same advantages. Some key figures in this fight were Horace Mann and Catherine Beecher, who was the daughter of Lyman Beecher, who was the prominent leader in the Second Great Awakening and temperance movement. In addition to fighting for socioeconomic equality in schooling, Mann and Beecher also fought for higher schooling enrollment for female students as well. Overall, this reform created public schooling without economic or gender barriers in the United States and helped promote teacher training to increase school rigor. As a teacher, I would like to tip my cap to both Horace Mann and Catherine Beecher for their efforts in making public education what it is today. Diversity within schools makes our classrooms rich and makes the conversation better than it ever could be before. Now on to our final reform movement, which is abolition. Though all reform movements that we've talked about thus far are important, many of them struggle to grasp the attention of the nation in the way that abolition did throughout the 19th century. As the country continued to expand westward, each new state that was added had to answer the same question. Would it come in as a free state or would it come in as a slave state? This question kind of acted as a mosquito around the United States' head. No matter how much bug spray or compromises they threw at it, it just continued to fly around. And this question was a constant reminder for both the government and the people about the mounting problem that slavery continued to cause for the United States. But before we get onto the slides about abolition, it's important for me to step on my soapbox for just a moment to make something very abundantly clear about abolition and slavery as a whole. Though we were talking about this as a 19th century reform movement, I don't want you to think that people didn't fight against slavery prior to this point. 
all the people who were forced into enslavement were against slavery. I'll say it for the people way in the back of the YouTube studio. All enslaved people were against the institution of slavery. There were no benefits for this for enslaved people and certainly none that outweighed the cost of it for the people who were forced into it. Anyone who says otherwise is in denial and for the purpose of this video, we're going to leave that in Egypt. Now that I can step off my soapbox, we can look at some of our main abolitionists who are unsurprisingly people who escaped slavery and therefore have firsthand accounts of how terrible it is. Let's take a look. The first abolitionist we'll dive into here is Frederick Douglass. Born into an enslaved life, Douglass is best known for his mysterious escape to the North, autobiography of his time as an enslaved person, and impact on the abolitionist movement in the North. Coming from someone who is primarily a fiction reader, Douglas's book is one of the best nonfiction books that I have ever read. His depictions of life as an enslaved person is so descriptive that it transports the reader to the horrible places and inside the experiences that he had. While obviously this is not a happy read, if you're looking to understand the plight of enslaved people and the millions that endured it, Douglas's book is a great place to start. Plus, it says a lot in only 100 pages. Okay, now back to our abolitionists. In addition to his writings on slavery, Douglas also became an extremely vocal figure in the North about abolitionism and had a profound impact on politics. Many historians confirm Douglas's direct impact on Lincoln and the actions he took as the president to eradicate slavery. Our next abolitionist is gaining traction to become the next face of the $20 bill. A perfect replacement for an enslaver like Andrew Jackson is Harriet Tubman. Also born into slavery, Harriet Tubman was also able to escape the clutches of the institution, but what makes her truly magnificent is her willingness to return to slave states to help others escape. Tubman was a person of many nicknames, such as Moses, General Tubman, or simply Conductor, since she was a crucial member of the Underground Railroad. Now, while we're on the topic, let's get one thing straight about the Underground Railroad. This is not a train that runs underground that brings enslaved people to free states. So, what is the Underground Railroad then, and how did it get its name? Well, Underground derives from the fact that it was kept a secret from as many people as humanly possible. This fact is brought up in Douglas's book as he harps on those people who openly speak about the, uh, the, about the railroad because it's destroying the effectiveness because more people will then know about it. The railroad portion of the name stems from the multiple pathways that the Underground Railroad often took, similar to a train. Additionally, the code names of the people and places took on mirrored to those of the train industry. For example, a leader would be known as a conductor, and a safe house along the way, which were typically homes of trusted abolitionists, were known as stations. Those code names allowed for the discussion of the perilous trail to have a layer of cover for those who were going to be traveling it. The final two abolitionist reformers that I'll be covering here are William Lloyd Garrison and Harriet Beecher Stowe. You're probably sitting in your chair thinking, wait a second, I've heard the name Beecher on three separate occasions, and you'd be right. I guess reform is a genetic chain that runs through their family. Anyway, these reformers had two things in common. They attacked the institution of slavery through writing, which helped spread the word across the North, and as stated before, they were white. While this latter fact might seem unnecessary, white Northern abolitionists posed a serious threat to the institution of slavery and exposing the reality of what it was to those who remained largely unaware of the North. Garrison wrote uh, a slavery newspaper aptly named The Liberator, Harry Peter Stowe, on the other hand, in her spare time while she wasn't listening to her dad's concert-like sermons or her sister's talk about education, managed to write one of the best-selling books of all time. And no, it wasn't Harry Potter. Although, can you imagine how ma magic would go over in that time period? Ha! <laughs> People would be like, You liar! Her book was titled Uncle Tom's Cabin and had a profound impact on the way people, especially those in the North, thought about slavery. Her book told the story of an enslaved man, Tom, who is described as a nice, understanding person, yet experiences the horrors of slavery and racism throughout his life. Uncle Tom's Cabin exposed slavery through the literature, and the 19th century was the best-selling book only behind the Bible, which is wild. The truth about slavery was spread due to the, both the Liberator and books like Uncle Tom's Cabin, terrifying slaveholders as they were exposed to the people of the North and a larger wedge than ever before was put between the two halves of the country, thus leading to civil war. 
Though many of these reforms had delayed impacts due to the impending civil war, many of them paved the way for major necessary changes to the United States. As you've likely caught on by the thumbnail, and hopefully seen throughout the course of the video, most of these reforms were led by powerful women and would prove instrumental to changing our country for the better. Well guys, that's all I really got for you today. If you haven't already liked the video and subscribed to the channel, I would really appreciate it if you did. But other than that, glasses dismissed.